Fred Decker, he made me feel really, the comfort level on the set was, was like you were at home in your living room, <laughs> really, which made it really easy to work with him, really easy. He knows film and he knows filmmaking. Um, whether he was going to be able to execute it, I can remember, you know, on the first day, and he's, he's, he looked younger than we did, right? He looked like the characters, JC and Chris, you know, he was, he was just one of us and indistinguishable from the rest of the frat house crew. It was just, a, just an absolute joy to work with and he really had that, that genius. Fred was then, I think still is now, a 12-year-old boy watching Creature Feature at 3.30 on a Saturday afternoon. He's watching these, these little horror films, these big horror films, and he's enjoying them. And that's what he brought the Night of the Creeps. I was always watching science fiction, horror, fantasy movies of the Fantastic since I was a little kid. And when I was around 12, I bought an 8 millimeter camera and uh, started making my own films. And they kind of inevitably gravitated in that direction. Well, I was really lucky. I went to UCLA at a time in the early 80s when there was a, tr a group of uh, tremendously talented um, actors, directors, writers, um, uh, Shane Black, who wrote Lethal Weapon, of course, and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and Ed Solomon and Chris Matheson, who wrote the Bill and Ted movies, and uh, Ryan Rowe, who wrote Charlie's Angels, and we had this sort of unofficial fraternity, which was a house that we rented. Uh, it was it was kind of the unofficial uh, film nerd fraternity, which we called the Pad of Guys, and um, it was around for for years. You know, somebody would move in, and then somebody else would move out and somebody else would move in and and we were always making movies sh shooting on video and um, and film and it, it was really great it was kind of um, um, an opportunity to, to learn by by screwing up Freeze! <sighs> I didn't really sort of come up with the idea for this movie as much as let it sort of simmer because all of these science fiction and fantasy and you know bad B movies all this stuff was in my head for years and that and and so it was sort of simmering so the the real question is at what point did I sort of lift the lid on the stew pot and see what was in there and uh, the answer is it was one night I was I, I was at the pad of guys uh, I was having a hard time sleeping and uh, for fans of the film, they, they probably won't believe this, but it's true. The first thing that came to me for the movie was the line, thrill me. I couldn't sleep, and I thought, a guy, he's two-fisted, he's tough, I don't know what he does, but he's, he's sad, he's melancholy. I thought, that'd be great. Let's have a scene with a nightmare, and, and he's awakened by the phone, and he grabs the phone, he snatches it up, and he says, thrill me. I said, okay, who is he? This is the middle of the night. This is my process at that time. Okay, who is he? Well, I thought, well, maybe he's a cop because he's from the Raymond Chandler mode and sort of the two, the two-fisted, cigarette-smoking, hard-drinking guy. Okay, so he's a cop. So then I had to figure out why he's being called and, you know, clearly some kind of crime must have occurred. At that time, I was making a short film that was sort of going to be my entree, my, my director's showreel. And I had conceived these characters, these college kids, um, one of whom is sort of our hero nerd, and then there's his sidekick. And it was a science fiction piece. It was actually a time travel movie, a little short film. I ended up actually making five minutes of it. Um, but I had these two characters, um, and uh, one of them was this sort of heartbroken college freshman who, who had a crush on this girl. And I said, okay, well, why don't I just take these two guys who became Chris and JC in Creeps and just put them into the movie? So whatever they did, resulted in the cop being called. So this, so now the story's sort of coming together. I have three characters. I have the cop, the detective, I have the, the nerd, I have the sidekick. I said, we've got to have a pretty girl. So the Cynthia character came into being. And then it was a matter, back to my stew analogy, of just taking all of the stuff that was in my head from movies that I would loved as a kid uh, to, to, to put into the stew. So I thought, OK, uh, zombies can't beat zombies, so uh, I knew it eventually there would be some, uh, some shambling dead people, and I thought, 
space aliens always works. Got to have some space aliens. So uh, some, let's get some more pretty girls, have them take their clothes off. So it was that kind of like taking all of the B-movie crap and just throwing it all into the blender and hitting the puree button. And uh, I wrote it in about two weeks, actually. What is this, a homicide or a bad B-movie? I didn't think it was uh, exactly, you know, kind of Oscar winning uh, material and I really wanted to be a director so I sort of said look why don't I just attach myself tell my agent I'm attached to this to direct it send it out to the studios and see what kind of nibbles we get and but what you generally do in the Hollywood system is find a producer first well the first time I heard of Night of the Creeps two friends of mine who were agents at CAA called me to tell me I they had this incredible script they knew I would love and I needed to read it at lunchtime which I thought was insane. I said, there's no chance. But my lunch was canceled. I sat down, I read it, and I just fell in love. I remembered a guy, Jeff Zagansky, I'd worked with, was the head of TriStar. And I called him, I remember, it was on a Thursday. And I said, Jeff, I have this incredible script. You have to read. And uh, he said, look, I'm off to my company retreat. I said, Jeff, you want to take this with you? Because I have three other studios that want it. I didn't, hadn't even sent it to another studio. But I knew Jeff, and I knew it would make him want the script even more. So he said, okay, I'll take it, but I can't guarantee that I'm gonna read it. I said, okay, fine. And Monday, the first call I get, I walk in the office, Jeff Skagansky call. And I called him back, and I said, okay. You know, and he said, I really wanna do it. I said, great, you know, why don't you send us your notes? And he said, Chuck, notes, I don't have any notes. I want to make the movie, which was just shocking to me. Oh, my God. Well, my first impression of Fred was kind of interesting because my two friends had warned me. They said, you know, he's really shy. I remember thinking, you know, how on earth is someone who's shy going to command a movie crew? And he came in. He was very shy. He was very cute. He called me Mr. Gordon. And I must say, first day on the set, totally took control. It was like a different guy. It was like General Patton. It was phenomenal. Please! Your first movie, you always want to do everything. Uh, because you may not get another chance to do it. So uh, I knew there's a, there's a thing, there's a, there's a shot in Jaws, which is my favorite movie, when um, uh, Chief Brody, see, he's been waiting to see if the shark's gonna strike, and it's a summer day and everybody's out on the beach, and he looks and, and finally he sees that fin come up and he sees the kid attacked, and his, his nightmare has come true. And the idea is that you're, you're tracking and you're zooming at the same time, you're zooming out and you're pushing in, um, or vice versa. And what it does is it completely distorts the focal length of the image. And I said, well, I gotta do a, I gotta do a Spielberg warp zoom. So I got to do that. I got to put Tom Atkins on a dolly and spin him around the room shooting his gun. Spielberg was also hugely influential on the nightmare scene in which Detective Cameron sees his high school sweetheart uh, coming up out of the water, which we, um, reversed the film and that was also overcrank so it's in slow motion so all those tricks that I'd always wanted to do that I couldn't do as, a, as an amateur filmmaker I got to play around with it's really interesting there's an aspect of filmmaking that they don't talk about in film school, which is the kind of military campaign element of it. And as a director, yeah, you're an artist and you're the auteur and all that crap, but you also are leading um, a, a, a professional team to accomplish a goal. A lot of people forget that. And there's uh, on everything that I've ever done uh, as a director, there's that day where I can feel the shift where the crew has been watching me from day one, does he know what he's doing? Should we follow him into battle? And there's always that moment where you say the right thing or you do the right thing or whatever it is, and they go, oh, okay, yeah, we'll follow him, we know what he's doing. And that was, uh, that was fun. On this particular movie, that was uh, on a scene that isn't in the movie. We, we cut it out. But uh, it was a fairly elaborate sort of thing that I, 
that I choreographed in terms of staging, and I could feel the crew kind of go, ooh, this guy maybe, you know, knows what he's doing. Tom Atkins, wow. He was phenomenal to work with. Like he, he honestly it taught me just being around him. You, you learned how a real, a real actor did their job, right? And how they came prepared and, and how far they were prepared to go to get what they wanted on the screen. He was the serious one and he's a great actor. He, he just brings so much life to his roles and he is so on it. He is the epitome of a professional actor, you know, he comes in, he does a great job, never complained about being up all night, every night, and it was just a great experience to have some camera time with someone like that. It came to me, I think, in 1985, does that sound right? And it was, um, I forget what I had just, I had just finished something not long before that, and Fred gave me a holler, or gave my agent a holler, and they said, uh, how about going over and meeting this guy and take a look at this script and see what you think, and uh, I loved it. I just, uh, I loved the whole thing. <laughs> I loved the cop, you know, Ray Cameron is a great character, and I thought, God, I, yeah, I would love to do this, so it, it was, uh, it was easy, fairly painless. Detective Cameron? No, Bullwinkle Moose. Thrill me. Ray Cameron had gone through a lot. I mean, his poor, <laughs> dearly beloved was uh, wiped out in the terrible axe murder. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, he had wonderful lines. Oh, my God, they were so rich. I got good news and bad news, girls. The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. Doc, it's Miller time. A woman came up to me in a grocery store one day and she said, oh my God, thrill me, thrill me. And I said, oh, you saw the movie, Night of the Creeps. She said, look. And she pulled out of her bag a whole bunch of these promotional pencils that said Thrill Me on there and the name of her little company. I don't know what it was, but I thought, wow. Yeah, that was it. And it's Miller time. I said that a lot and called uh, Jason Spanky and Steve Alfalfa. And I remember driving around this wonderful, was it a 49 Merc? Or something with skirts and old, old, wonderful old car. I loved Ray Cameron for all that stuff of his life. Wonderful. When people, anyone asks me, what's the favorite movie you've ever made? Of all the films that I've made, about 30, I guess. And Night of the Creeps is my answer. And it's, <laughs> it was just the most pure, fun job of all the jobs I've ever had. It was uh, a joy to work with Fred and Jason and Jill and Steve and, and just be bouncing around L.A. and driving that old Merc and throwing names of my pals in the movie when I could to reach out for Burnett and Hoffman and... Uh, oh God, it, it just, it was a treat.
Jason, was okay. there a fraternity in Germany. the movie in Germany? <laughs> no. Hello, delay. Everybody fell in love with Jill. Uh, and it's impossible not to, right? She's that kind of a person, she, you know, beautiful outside and in, and everybody on the set fell in love with her immediately. And in a, in, in a really positive way, you know, it, she was, she was a, a great friend to everybody. And then, you know, she, I think she delivers just the performance in the film that really makes it, makes you care. Come on, what's not to love about Jill? Huh? You know, I was lucky enough to get to do two films back to back with her and we really formed a really close bond and got to be great, great friends. I think she was uh, perfectly cast, you know, she was the vulnerable, cute, perfect little 80s girl. I had just finished a, a, my first starring role in a film called Thunder Run and we had spent three months in Laughlin, Nevada. I still think I still hear the ringing from all the, you know, <laughs> machines downstairs. But um, told me about Fred Decker and how old he was. He was a young upcoming director and it sounded like the funnest film to make. And when I got it, I was very surprised, very happy, and I was so excited to work with Fred because he was so cool. And I just knew that it was just going to be this fun family, you know, there's a script, but do what you want kind of atmosphere. And it really was. It was, it was so much fun. Look, I'm sorry things didn't work out. We're just... Two different people. That doesn't mean that it's over forever. When I read the part for Cynthia Cronenberg, I know this might sound a little cliche, but I really felt a connection. Mainly because most of my friends growing up, I was always the naive one. I was always the gullible one. Um, you could always fake me out, trick me, my friends had a lot of fun with me uh, because of that. And with Cynthia Cronenberg, she was she was very sweet. And, and I really, you know, I've always wanted to have that really hot guy and be able to, you know, do one of these things. <laughs> so that was really cool. Coming, babe? It has so much diversity in the film and it catches so many age groups at so many levels. You know, the younger ones were scared and, you know, it was really, I think, a cult film before its time. I really do. So I, I love being a part of it, even today. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have that where I was. They don't have that in Canada. No, they don't have that. It's not, it's not up there yet. I love Steve Marshall. <laughs> I think I had a crush on him through the whole film. <laughs> Steve Marshall. And he loved you too. Aww. <laughs> yep. Um, that's my Steve. We hung out the entire time, whether we were filming or not, you know, we just, we got along really well. And again, he was older and wiser, so he taught me a lot. For a foreigner, that guy was all right. You know what I mean? We got a pretty close bond. And uh, he's got a lot of knowledge working on pools, pool filters, and things like that that a lot of people wouldn't know. And I, I found out I had him help me clean my pool at my parents' house quite a bit. Hey, fuck you, Chris. I was a child of the film industry. My father's a film producer, uh, and so I started young in film production. I was a PA, production assistant in, in films when I was a kid, and worked my way up through the ranks. And I was actually doing production managing and working on, in Yugoslavia on a film uh, there, and I decided to stay and uh, ended up working with a bunch of great actors in a, in a miniseries that had come up, uh, including a fellow 
nobody knows him, Robert Downey Jr. But um, he, he and I became really good friends, and he told me, you know, get your butt to L.A. and come with me and live with me, and we'll get you some work. And then um, I said, really, is that the way it works? And he said, sure. So he, I flew to L.A., and he met me at the airport, took me to dinner, and that night I had a manager and an agent in L.A., and the next day I was going out on auditions, and six weeks later I landed uh, the role in Night of the Creeps. So why don't you just get off our case and go practice goose-stepping or something? Brad, stop! Well, it's interesting because, uh, first, it, you know, it, it wasn't an issue, and I thought I could do it really well, like, pretend to be afflicted, uh, you know, with a physical impairment, but I didn't really understand why the character had that uh, affliction, and it it was something that Fred never explained to me, um, and I've asked him, and he said it was just a carryover from a short story that he'd done um, that turned into the script, and it was part of this character. Now, I actually understand it because the, there would have been competition between Chris and JC for the girls and stuff, but JC had put himself into that secondary position and was living vicariously through his best friend Chris, um, and he allowed that to be, you know, sort of uh, almost his excuse, but and, and develop this kind of hardened, uh, wisecracking exterior and stuff like that. But I think that when you get to the point in the film where there's the voiceover where I have, you know, met my demise, uh, that you understand how important that part of the character was to him that you know how much he owned you know being afflicted and how much he desired to to walk so I don't know it, it was it was an interesting part of the character uh, in the end but I never really understood why kind of as I was doing it and it was only later when I saw the film that that manifest that how that manifests itself that affliction I carried him. You guys don't even know. I carried him. He got so into character, and he would put his crutches down. Ow. Jason, help me out. Pick me out. Oh, I carried my trailer. Jason is one of the funniest people on the planet. He is just hilarious, like deadpan, but hilarious. And and it's so uh, it's so surprising coming from him because he's got this sweet face and he just doesn't look like a guy who's got any evil in him at all and he is absolutely cruel to people because he just plays that it's all greek to me <clears throat> jason lively is amazing he is so full of life and when i first met him i felt like brother and sister we were so comfortable together and our he's a jokester and I'm the gullible, naive one. So he was one of those that had a lot of fun with, with me. And um, he treated me like a sister. We, we, were, we connected so well. What? Really? You know, Night of the Creeps came not long after European vacation. And uh, it was my first, first lead in a film. And I was really excited about it. And, uh, you know, at first I was a little bummed because I'd auditioned for JC and I thought JC was the, the role, the challenging role. And But now I watch the film again, I'm glad I got Chris. What? Oh, <laughs> little distractions in my interview there. No, it was a blast. I did. I loved all the action stuff. I loved it when I got to have the shotgun. I loved working with Tom Atkins and let him lay his heavy cop stuff on me. I loved being in the scenes when they would have you know, a robotic head that's going to split open and the creeps come out and all that stuff for me was just, you know, it's it's like adult uh, Disneyland, you know, it's make-believe and it's all right there for you, so it makes it a little easier to get into your character. What? <laughs> they got alfalfa. Fred did a great job of writing the script, he really did. A lot of scripts you can interpret as an actor, like, well, maybe he wants to do it this way, maybe it should be done this way, but it was pretty clear the way the lines were written, the angles he wanted us to take. And, um, you know, I think he sort of saw me. I think and know from talking to Fred that my character was kind of based on his experiences 
going up and through college and maybe not being the, I don't want to say that. I'm sure he was the coolest guy at his school, but just in case he wasn't, you know, he found a guy like me to portray that. So Fred really would take me aside sometimes and say, okay, this is what, this is how I see it as any good director will. And so I can't take credit for all that straight face stuff. Give me a fucking break. It was a great opportunity for me, it really was. I was really excited to get it. It looked like a lot of fun to do, and uh, it was like a big party, especially at that age. I see you looking behind me. Are these guys, all right. I'll go back to my conversation here, but this is how the whole movie was. This is how we did it. It didn't matter if they're really filming and wasting a lot of money, Steve would be over here making comments and jokes, and you have a, a, an environment like that and a set like that, I think that some of it has to spill over into the film and the people can appreciate that bond that they see and go, oh, those guys really are friends. You know, you really can believe that we were friends because we were. You learned that in your Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank right. you. Mwah. Right after uh, I did Nightmare on Elm Street, and Fred Decker, the director, saw an article on me in one of the trade magazines and decided to contact me. People I selected for Night of the Creeps were people that I had worked with on other films uh, in other companies. Um, Howard Berger, um, Robert Kurtzman, they're like the K and the B and K and B effects. Um, and then there was a uh, mechanical person was Ted Ray he's like he, kind of a big shot now um, and then there were just all these people that I'd worked with uh, like very closely with I saw the kind of talent they had sculpting talent molding talent painting and all that so it was kind of a very carefully selected crew I was there as a and pretty much we all did everything you know it's was a sculptor mold maker you know Dave kind of sold us all on the fact that like you guys will do your own gags like from beginning to end and that was really exciting because so many of the other shops and it's this way today as well is it's it's I don't want to say it's a factory but it is a sausage factory to some degree you, know, you have your sculptors do this mold makers do this but Dave ran a very small shop because of the short schedule uh, once they started prep they didn't really have time for a casting process of uh, putting the beta zombies together so uh, Dave suggested that we all play the zombies in the movie and then do our own life casts and do our own makeups for the film so it would save time in prep uh, because they wouldn't have to go through a casting process. So Fred really liked that idea and we ended up all doing our own head casts and our own makeups for the movie, which was kind of cool because we got to, to go down and play zombies and frat guys and drink and party guys. So. First we play ourselves, you know, before the accident happens. Um, before we become possessed by the by the little slug guys, the creeps, and then um, afterwards we're we're in full makeup, and then we all we all had dummy heads of each other to uh, you know they have to split open and have all the creeps come out of it. No! The creeps, there were several different kinds. There were some, believe it or not, they had little slot cars glued onto the bottom of them. And then we just uh, turn them on, set them on the ground, they go across the floor. They were stiff, didn't have any movement to them, but it was just something they needed to see going across the floor, something dark. So you could either run it on wheels across like a cement floor where they'd slither, or when it was in grass, we just tie a, a line to it and pull it through the grass as they wiggled. So it looked like, you know, they're scurrying. And, uh, and then they had, uh, you know, versions that would pour out of the heads when they popped open. And it was like kind of on a plunger rig where we'd shove them up with a lot of slime and stuff and it would fall out 
as the head split open. And we just produced, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. You know, I'm sure Dave has a giant box filled with, you know, these slug creeps, you know, out somewhere. So, um, but yeah, I mean, those were the those were our, our big f uh, focus, you know. And like I said, all the zombie makeups, which there's a lot of. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then we had the aliens. We built two aliens that were on little people, and they were just simple foam rubber suits with hands and feet, and had mechanical heads, you know, that were kind of stove piped out. And I think I remember they're just, you know, simple radio control. I think they were radio controlled heads and mouths and lips and blinks and eyes and brows and things like that. The standard 80s monster, you know, mechanical head that you would have. The aliens in the beginning were um, Fred's design. He said he just wanted, he wanted them to have baby bodies, but have these enormous heads with these big frowns on them. So um, I did several sketches and then I did also a clay, a miniature clay sculpture to uh, get the design of it before we started on the whole thing. They had a little bit of mechanical movement in their heads. I think one of them blinked and another one, the other two uh, had mouths that opened and closed. So it wasn't a real mechanical thing. It was more of a, a visual thing. I, I, you know, the most challenging effect on the film was probably the, the puppet heads and the animatronic stuff for the amount of time. And it was, like I said, a short schedule. Um, as far as the makeup stuff goes, we kind of, because we were using ourselves, designing that we kind of skipped a stage of having to wait and cram everything into the last minute once the cast came aboard you know the exploding zombie head effects were uh, they were all just dummy heads made out of foam latex and with wigs and hair punched and all that but uh, Ted Ray had created this uh, mechanism to open them up on cue so they would open up and then there'd be a plunger underneath going up through the mouth and up through the head and all that and we'd load it with creeps and slime and all that, and as soon as the head opened, we'd push the plunger up and they'd come spilling out. And then they'd cut that into another scene of a, you know, them flying across the, and through the air. The other thing they had in the film, which was uh, Ted Ray was involved with, was the um, stop motion animation. And uh, Ted was always by the shop and uh, working in the shop with us. and. Uh, you know, because the worms had a lot to do with him as well, and the, and he had to animate them, so we had to run a bunch of opposable versions, anima, you know, for animation, with an armature that he could animate the whole squiggly wall and all that stuff. They weren't terribly happy with one of the sequences in the show, and so they'd asked Ted uh, to do this animation, and it was this, um, it was the uh, the big uh, sequence in the basement with this pile of creeps. And we had, uh, you know, only a couple of weeks to put it together, which at that time, you know, was impossible. These days it's just, you know, a matter of custom. Um, so we started working together and making this uh, crazy miniature creep scene. It was a lot of stuff to get done in a very short period of time. Um, you know, sometimes pressure was intense and tempers rose. I mean, there was a lot of times guys got into it with each other and got into it with Dave and Dave would get into it with them. You know, it's just the way it was. You know, it's a combination of the mixture of, you know, having that time crunch and just people being in close quarters. And, and I do think the chemicals added a lot to it. It's, I notice sometimes some of the guys will get irritable. I'm like, okay, you're done doing that now. We had a lot of long hours because of the short, you know, uh, pre-production time. Um, there was one guy that used to pull pranks on everybody. So at one point, we all got fed up with it. So we got out our video camera, waited for him to come back from lunch, and we had uh, designed a, a crucifix. And we actually duct taped him onto the crucifix and then set him outside on a main street. We put this this long blonde wig on, made him up as a woman, and... <laughs> and put, hung a sign on his chest that said woman cheap and then crossed that cheap and said free and then we carried it out to the off the off ramp on on uh sherman way and wits it you know right there off the 170 and put it out there and uh people were driving by honking their horns stuff like that so we, every shop does that kind of to relieve stress and uh, under you know you're under a, a schedule and and everyone's freaking out so every once in a while you had to kind of do something really stupid and juvenile, <laughs> so. Later, dude.
Night of the Creeps, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, looking at it now, it, it was a real uh, touchstone for so many of us in the makeup effects business, and um, so many of us uh, look back at it, you know, as a as a period that really uh, was was quite good for uh, makeup effects and horror movies and and monsters in general because things you know had a a nice personal touch to them. It wasn't overly produced. We didn't have to answer to 20 producers. Um, we made monsters we thought we were, that were cool and effects that we thought were cool and we hoped that the audience members thought they were cool because we were audience members. When you're first starting out you're basically uh, trying to absorb everything you can uh, from everybody on set and how a set works and so in those days, it was like, well, what, what's that guy do over there? That's the grip, you know, <laughs> and that's the, the gaffer. And then you kind of get a handle on it, and you watch the actors, and you watch the director, and how he sets up shots, and how he deals with the actors. And it's kind of the best thing about getting in the film industry and learning and progressing is from learning of all the movies you've worked on, learning what other people do. It is amazing uh, that people, um, still really dig it you know people like those movies I guess it's it is an essential 80s horror movie if you think about it, it really is like you watch that film and you're like man that's the 80s you know and that's horror in the 80s you know and, but it is amazing how this movie has a life I thought it was really well done it was tongue-in-cheek but it was you know it was fun it was a fun film to watch and and you know I don't know why they dumped it but um, it's back <laughs> interesting thing about Night of the Creeps was that, and it's like really interests me because I didn't want to do just another horror movie, but this was a very interesting movie, and it proved this way in the, the test screenings we had. We had a movie that had the scare factor for the teenage boys, but also had humor, had a love story, and it also attracted you know, as many women and young girls as it did boys. When we started seeing dailies, we started saying, well, you know, we think you have, we have something here. I mean, there's an old saying in Hollywood that I can't take credit for, that no movie is as good as dailies or as bad as the first cut. Well, this is a movie that actually was, at the end of the day, we thought as good as the dailies we were watching every day. Post-production was pretty straightforward on this film. Um, there is a, um, a little story, which is not my favorite story in the world, which is we had a disastrous preview of this movie. I was a newbie, didn't really know what I was doing as far as how far along the picture should be before you show it to people. Um, I thought that an audience would be fairly forgiving in terms of scenes missing and effects not finished and things like that. Even though many people see the preview as some kind of evil act that forced upon poor directors uh, by marketing departments. The thing that I like about a preview screening is that it tells you whether the things that you thought were working are indeed working, or the things that you thought were problems are indeed a problem. I, I find that there are often surprises in previews. Uh, audiences react to things in ways you never expect. And in fact, um, I have found, not necessarily with Night of the Creeps, but in other films, that you can hold an audience to the very end but if you goof up the ending, you've lost them for the whole film. We showed the movie at MGM, now Sony, and um, it was a disaster. I mean, it was, uh, it was mortifying for me personally. And I think it's one of the reasons that the ending of the film was changed, because we had cut in a temporary version of the optical effect at the end of the film. And neither the audience nor the studio had any idea what it was. And I kept saying, well, read the script. And of course, the problem is the audience hasn't read the script. So uh, that was really difficult. And I really have to tip my hat to Jeff Zagansky, 
and Casey Silver, who ran the studio, who, who were justifiably nervous, but said, look, we think maybe we could get a little bit more oomph out of the ending of the movie. And they gave me more money, and um, I added a couple of shots, and I added, in fact, a whole sequence, which is the garden shed sequence, which we went back, built the exterior of the sorority, which had existed at USC, which had built that side of the building uh, on stage, and did the whole garden shed sequence with the lawnmower and all that stuff, and added that to the, to the finale of the movie, which I think, um, you know, is immeasurably uh, better. Real good plan. Ultimately, the UFO ending, the spaceship ending, was an ending on top of an ending. It, it always felt like uh, something that was going to thrust us into Night of the Creeps Part 2. Uh, so, once you've gone through this film and the, the fraternity house, the sorority house has exploded and burned and our two, uh, uh, our two lovers are entwined in their arms and hugging, you know, now to go to the lumbering detective, you know, still smoldering in this, just for this moment over the cemetery, seemed a bit long. And was it worth it? That was always the big question. Is it worth it? The dog was an attempt to do a kind of a cheap scare ending, which was very popular in those days, thanks to, um, you know, uh, Brian De Palma's carry. I mean, it's fantastic. The ending is very uh, effective and scary, and it really works. Um, but a lot of lesser films tried to ape it, and so you have a lot of 80s horror movies with these sort of bad, cheap scare endings. And I have nothing against a scare if it doesn't sort of violate the rest of the movie. And in this case, I have to take uh, I have to take the blame because I came up with it. Um, but in fact, to me, it's a real betrayal of the whole movie because why have these kids spent 90 minutes trying to defeat this problem when the problem shows up in the last you know 48 frames of the of the picture, ostensibly killing them and turning them into zombies? So I hated it from the word go. And of course, it had the reaction from the audience that one would expect, which was that they were cheated. There was a, a, a chintzy ending. So having then seen the UFO ending, I was like, oh, okay, I like it, you know. There was some tough times during post-production, um, but once we knew that we had a cut that was in pretty good shape, then it was time to start thinking about music. And. Um, Barry was Barry Devorzon was somebody who uh, had worked with Chuck and his brother Larry Gordon uh, previously on uh, I think a couple of Walter Hill's films and um, he, he had done the uh, Burt Reynolds mo uh, cop movie called Stick and uh, I only knew him as the composer of uh, uh, Bless the Beast and the Children which then became uh, Nadia's theme which then became um, the theme from The Young and the Restless. It was kind of a fun picture about young people and creepy crawlies and all those things and so uh, I, I just I just had some fun with it and used electronics. I come from a very kind of as a fan of film music orchestral background and I remember going to Barry um, when we were talking about doing the movie and saying you know it should sound like this and I was playing him Jerry Goldsmith cues with you know 300 piece orchestras and he was he looked at me like I was crazy. I love orchestral scores but for certain vehicles, for certain pictures, uh, you can't beat rock and roll and synthesizers. And you know, they just give you an edge and a, and a feeling and an electricity that you can't get out of an orchestra. He very much sort of went off and did the score. Um, I, I knew I wanted a love theme for Cynthia. Um, but th the rest of my direction was relatively hands off, other than telling him, that, you know, this is not a pest. This is a pastiche, but it's not a spoof. So don't make fun of the movie. The, mu the music needs to tell us that this is a real story, that, that we care about these characters, that this is a real movie, and that it should be scary. And um, I've grown to really be fond of the score over the years. Um, but he went off and he did it with his synthesizers and all that. And, and the first time I heard it was on the stage at the uh, at Todd A.O. at the mixing stage, and it was. Um, it's really cool to say, oh, wow, there's, there's music on my movie now. I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it, I, I enjoyed it. I thought, you know, 
it was entertaining, and that's what it's all about. Well, the release of Night of the Creeps was very um, disappointing and hard to, to take. Um, unfortunately, Fred and I were baby producer and director at the time, had no real power, and um, from the beginning, and again, it's very subjective, but from the beginning, we just thought the campaign wasn't what it should have been. Our first one sheet that we got was a hand going through the window of the sorority house, turning the doorknob, and we went to the studio and we said, guys, there's a movie out called House that has a zombie ringing a doorbell. People are gonna think they've seen this movie. Oh, you guys are kids, we hear you, but we like this. And it just went, 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 and we got nowhere, and finally the decision was made to release the movie regionally. I think that because of this uh, little contretemp with the ending and with the, with the preview that didn't go that well, I think um, I was becoming frustrated and I think that my frustration may have impeded my relationship with the studio to the point where they said, sort of said, well, we can make money with this, but how much and do we really care? And uh, I, think, I think I made some fundamental mistakes uh, just in terms of the politics of filmmaking at that point. Um, and that may have had an effect on the release, I'm not sure. You know, it was very disheartening. And even at the end of the day, the New York Times gave a pretty dang decent review to a horror movie. I mean, come on, you know. I've had Academy-nominated movies that didn't get as good of reviews. And, you know, one of the things that was in the review said, Night of the Creeps snuck, under, snuck into town virtually unannounced. So that's just a campaign that didn't work. Looking back on Night of the Creeps now, I have no regrets except that it didn't do better at the box office. You know, I never regret even the bombs, truthfully, because of the people you meet. Every movie you meet, somebody else great, and somebody that you continue a relationship for the rest of your career, and a friendship, you know, that transcends movies. So, no, I have no regrets whatsoever. It was not the heartbreak that it might have been, um, but certainly in the years following, uh, and, and because Monster Squad didn't do as well as I had hoped either, um, it was really crushing for a couple of years. I really felt like I had put my heart and soul into this movie and into both of these movies, and um, and nobody seemed to care. It's enormously gratifying to have made these little movies, you know, quite a few years ago and have people be so affected and affectionate about them. Um, it's, it, it, it really makes me feel great. And I've said before, and I'll say it again, I would have loved to have been making movies ever since I started and, you know, I'm, I had these fallow periods. 
But by the same token, there's a lot of directors even that I admire who've made a lot of movies and some of them aren't so great. Part of me feels good that I at least could make a couple of movies that people love rather than a whole bunch of movies that some of them are kind of crappy. So um, it, in a weird sort of way, um, RoboCop 3 notwithstanding, it cements my reputation in a way because I haven't stumbled too much so they can look back at these films and go, you know, this is a guy who really was uh, doing something special. So I, I would have been... You would have run. It's a great film, you know? Fred tied in all the aspects of all the different kind of horror film genres and put it all into one film. And I think at the time, during the 80s, it was maybe a little too campy. The people wanted more blood and gore and more shock value. And now that that's played out and you've gone and you've seen, you know, so many decapitations and all this and that, to watch a film like that that has some shock value, but a real witty script, people really appreciate and they, they get the style he was going for now. And I think that's just the difference in, in, uh, in the fans. Night of the Creeps is probably my favorite B movie of the 80s, probably just, or my favorite B movie of all time for that matter. I think the reason why it's held up for so long, over uh, the 23 years that it, uh, since its initial release, is that it actually, it gets better with age. Um, it, it transcends time. It, uh, I think it was probably, it probably predates the postmodern horror genre by at least 10 years. Um, and it did it better than any of the ones that came out 10 years uh, after it. And I mean, it, it tears down the fourth wall. It's totally tongue in cheek. And um, it's just a total blast. I'm really disappointed that this is now worthless. <laughs> this cost a fortune. <laughs> All right. You know, things like Saw and the films now, they're, I don't like them. They're so grim. There's like no humor in them at all, no fun, and it's it's like a a scary movie that's just totally full of despair and hopelessness. I think, what the hell? I don't. I don't that's no fun. I like to be entertained, and I think they do too. The fans of uh, Night of the Creeps, and I think that's why they like it so much. Well, this is my first night seeing it. I've never seen it before. I'm a first comer, but um, I almost didn't come tonight. I'm so glad I did because it had one of my favorite things in the world, which uh, terrifies me and also makes me very happy, which is anything parasitic. So uh, that was a really good joy. And uh, anything with a flamethrower <laughs> can make my, uh, my heart warm up too right away. But it was a wonderful experience. I'm so glad I came. Well, this is a great film. I saw this back in the theater when it first came out. I'm an old guy. I'm one of the old people, so the old, people, but it still holds its true colors. People say it's a B movie. Nah, it's an A movie. It's an A plus movie. I don't understand why people keep calling it a B film. It's fantastic. You got flamethrowers. You got zombies. You got parasites. Parasites are always good in any film. You got a parasite crawling inside you. You're creeping me out every time. It's fantastic. I think the script, uh, the strength of that script and, the, and those performances gave gave the film a chance. Now, why people who you know have busy lives and stuff, and cer certainly there's no shortage of new product out there to to go uh, and and see, would take the time to go and find uh, the the gems that are that are out there. But it seems that it seems that that maybe the genre has grown and, and the support for the genre has grown and if you like this genre you must understand its roots and I think that Night of the Creeps forms part of the foundation of the genre it's not just a film that was part of a genre it was it forms part of the foundation and I think people who follow that genre have to know about it and and the genre is growing as a you know the market for that type of film is growing that's probably why <laughs> And, uh, I was not aware of the fan base that it has. I, I'm, I was shocked when I heard and very, very um, blessed to be a part of it. I'm, I'm thrilled. I am completely thrilled. And it coming out on DVD, huh, it's a long time waiting. A long time waiting, because I want to show my kids, <laughs> you know, my VHS doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
What's, what's great about Fred is he's able to throw everything in the kitchen sink into the movies and make it fun. You know, and I think that's, uh, you know, I mean, that, that's why I love Fred as a filmmaker. It's why I love this movie. It's why I love Monster Squad. It's, you know, they, he doesn't he doesn't just go for the uh, the quick and easy, you know? You know what I mean? It's not, uh, uh, it's not typical, you know, but it's fun. It's not like he's, you know, pandering to anybody except for himself. You can tell he loves making movies. Thank you, Heather Olsen. And I really want to say thank you. Well, I think the... the the Renaissance has been slow in building. Um, would I have liked to see the affection for these films translate to box office back when they came out and benefit my uh, ability to make more films? Obviously, yes. But short of that, I don't think I could ask for more, really. Uh, the fans of, of, of this film are so um, vocal and, and sweet and, and, and smart. You know, you know, I don't have I don't have a lot of people sort of you know drooling and so, oh, I love your movie. They, you know, the, it's a fairly sophisticated movie in a sense, and so I I admire people for seeing that in it. I thought when we were making it that it was a really going to be a wonderful wonderful movie, and it is a wonderful movie, and I am so sorry that. Uh, the, those people in power at that time didn't know what to do with it or didn't know how to uh, appreciate it or market it or sell it. And I felt really bad for Fred then. Not so much now, he's okay. He survived, we've all survived, and the movie has survived. And will for all time. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience to be a part of then and, and the fact that that opened up these doors 23 years later is amazing and it's just that much more special to me and I hope that the new group that's watching it watching it for the first time can see it and enjoy it and really appreciate how much fun it is to be involved with something like that. I am so happy and, and, and I will tell you all of my friends um, back home in Florida are so excited that they're coming on DVD um, that, that Night of the Creeps is going to be on TV. <laughs> Interestingly, it, it's something that I had, I assumed would be a footnote on a career that spanned you know, mega titles and uh, all these things that I was going to, and, and did you know he once starred in his little, in this little Night of the Creeps film, and it turns out it's, it's, it's the, the jewel on the ring of, of the acting ring, which, but you know what? It's a pretty shiny little diamond and I'm damn proud of it. If there was an enormous demand for it, um, I have thought about where the next installment would go. Um, the only problem with it is that I would not want to make that movie without Tom Atkins. And unfortunately, in the, in the director's cut of the movie, um, that's not going to be real easy to pull off. But, you know, it's the magic of the movies. Who knows? <laughs>